Harvard Divinity School. Uses and abuses of power in alternative spiritualities. Implications for spiritual care of patients and communities. April 28, 2023. It's nice to be here if only virtually. Uh, I've had a distant connection to this program uh, for the evolution of spirituality at Harvard since it started some years ago. And I spoke very briefly uh, during the first conference. So uh, it's nice. I'm nice to be here and to see how things are developing. And, and this particular conference theme was one that I was very excited to be sharing. Uh, and thank you, Carter, for opening up. Uh, Carter's a dear friend of mine. So it's, it's a joy. I didn't know when I initially submitted my paper that uh, I would have the opportunity to present with Carter, but uh, I'm, I'm happy we did. So uh, I want, this is a very pragmatic topic for me for a couple of reasons. Um, when I was 29 years old, I was living a very, I mean, I was, I was married. Uh, I was an engineer. I owned a white house with a white picket fence and I had spiritual interests. I was doing uh, some Buddhist meditation and, uh, I was uh, certainly so interested in these things. Um, but not in any extreme way. And then I met a spiritual teacher. Very soon after meeting him, had a very, very powerful awakening experience that I, I certainly wasn't expecting uh, that led me over the course of the next year to leave my career and my marriage and the White House and move into a spiritual community that was dedicated to very extreme forms of spiritual practice, where I lived for the next 20 years. Uh, and not only did I live in spiritual community for 20 years, I became my teacher's personal assistant, and I was his, I was his assistant for 12 years. Um, and like Carter, there's certain pieces I think I'll read from my paper. Uh, so this is a little bit just from the very introduction of the paper. It says, this paper is born out of my experience of living in a spiritual community dedicated to radical practices under the tutelage of a guru figure who demanded obedience and surrender. I lived in the community for 20 years and was my teacher's personal assistant for over a decade. My experience was a nearly indescribable mix of the truly miraculous and the bizarre, laced with a significant amount of unhealthy and sometimes abusive authority. I left that community 10 years ago, about a year before it collapsed entirely. My overall experience of those 20 years was profoundly positive. In spite of the wrongs that I was victim to, witnessed, and participated in, the effort of sorting through the rubble to determine what was profound, what was misguided, and what was abusive has occupied a considerable amount of my attention ever since. So that's a big part of the of my, the pragmatic nature of this for me is just to understand those 20 years uh, and what I was involved with, why I feel so positive about it overall, in spite of the fact that so much of it was, was really such a mess. One thing I wanna say right at the beginning here is everybody has their own experience in a situation like that. And my experience isn't, isn't you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to say it's it's typical or atypical because I just think everybody has a unique experience. And I'm speaking from my own experience of that. But I'm not only I didn't only write this paper as the former member of a spiritual community, I'm also writing it as someone who acts as a spiritual guide for others. Uh, now uh, I have I lead retreats, I teach meditation and mystical uh, philosophy. I have an online membership program with hundreds of members. Uh, after, after my, my spiritual community collapsed, I felt very uncertain 
about what to do next. But over a few years time, it became clear that uh, sharing the, the very best uh, that I had experienced in my spiritual life and continue to experience is uh, was what I was called to. So in writing this paper, my paper is called Mitigating the Risk of Extreme Spiritual Pursuit. So uh, I'm looking at that from the point of view of having been and continuing to be a practitioner of, uh, I think, fairly extreme spiritual pursuit. I'm fairly extremely dedicated to my practice. And also in my role as a, as a spiritual guide for people. Uh, so the first question that I ask in the paper, because, you know, I think, I think the idea that, that there's risk involved in extreme spiritual pursuit is not very controversial. The, the fact that, that this needs to be mitigated, the risk needs to be mitigated, but we all want to protect people from harm. That's not very controversial. Uh, but what I wanted to, what I started my paper with was an exploration of the legitimacy of extreme spiritual pursuit. Now, when I first had this awakening that I mentioned earlier and decided that I wanted to pursue this with my whole life, regardless of the cost, uh, and I was in at the time a very, a very good marriage. Uh, but I could see that where I was being called and where, you know, that life was leading were just divergent paths. Uh, and so I made a very difficult decision to leave that relationship. Now, unbeknownst to me, but I did later find out, actually, my wife and I, we, we split very amicably. Uh, but unbeknownst to me, Later, I found out that when my neighbors found out that I was leaving my marriage to join a spiritual community, they came up with a plan which they they pr proposed to my former wife, which was that they wanted to get in a room together, about 10 of them, and yeah. <clears throat> invite me for an intervention in which uh, they would yell at me until I changed my mind. Uh, now... What was particularly funny about this is I had very little relationship with any of those people. I mean, we had lived in that house for about four years and they it wasn't like we were a tight group of people. I hardly said anything to them. We hardly knew each other. But the idea that I would leave my wife to join a spiritual community was, they found so unacceptable that they literally wanted to get me in a room and yell at me to make me stop. And... I see this as a huge problem for those uh, individuals who feel compelled to extreme forms of spiritual pursuit. Uh, and the reason uh, I see it as a problem is because if it's not acceptable, if it's not, if it's not a legitimate choice that someone can make to engage in extreme spiritual pursuit, to join a community, maybe even to be devoted to a teacher if you feel so moved. If that's not a choice that our society recognizes as legitimate, then the only place people have to go to engage that way is in some shadowy edge of culture where nobody's looking, which is exactly where my community hung out. You know, we, we, we prided ourselves in being quite separate from culture at large. Uh, now, if, if we were in a culture which accepted this possibility, maybe we could have been more connected to the culture as we were doing our extreme practices. Maybe uh, it would have become less abusive. It would have been less abusive. I, you know, I don't know. I can't turn back the clock, but I know that as I see it, because as my teacher's personal assistant, not only was I intimately involved with all aspects of our community, I met many other teachers over those 20 years. I became close friends with many of the, the personal assistants of those teachers. And so I got an intimate view of other communities and I could see how they basically 
there's a pattern. There's a way that they all operate the same. And one of the things that that's similar is they are all they all operate under the radar. And uh, and I just think if we do want to mitigate the risk of extreme spiritual pursuit, legitimizing that choice is is a first step. So I am going to read a little bit uh, from my paper uh, on this topic that says, the pursuit of spiritual enlightenment in whatever form or tradition has always involved a willingness to surrender to the path regardless of where it leads. I believe that the path to enlightenment cannot be followed in moderation because we must pursue the ultimate realization on its own terms. One may disagree with this, but that is not the question I'm asking. The question is, if one does believe this, do they have the right to embark on a path of spiritual pursuit that others would see as potentially dangerous and harmful? Or must they remain more tightly bound to a spiritual life that fits into the values of society? Is there room for extreme spiritual pursuit? If our culture does not recognize the right to engage in extreme spiritual pursuit, then those who make that choice, and history tells us that there are always those who do, are forced to engage with them in the unruly edges of society. The social aim of protecting people from harmful spiritual practices might be inadvertently forcing those activities into cultural shadows where the most virulent forms of them can thrive and fester more easily. I believe that this program for the evolution of spirituality is an attempt to bring those edgy spiritual pursuits respectfully into the light of conscious awareness so the best forms and practices can be identified and encouraged. The creation of respectful forums of mutual exploration is an important step in mitigating the risk of extreme spiritual pursuit. So that is the conclusion, that's the concluding thought of the first part of the paper, which involves uh, this idea that these pursuits need to be legitimized. And I think, you know, I have a very, very good friend who uh, I met in community. When she first joined the community, uh, her parents were so uh, they were so distressed that they hired an anti-cult group uh, who came to the house uh, pretending to be family psychologists, uh, but actually employing. Uh, you know, deconditioning methods on her to force her to stay home and not go back. And I just think it's fascinating that there are many things that we engage in, people are allowed to engage in that are seen as legitimate things that one can engage in that could be considered harmful uh, and dangerous. You know, uh, some as... <clears throat> Some as simple as driving a car. We drive we cars every day and people get hurt and killed every day driving cars, but we we don't we recognize that's just part of life. But also things like uh, joining military service, obviously a very dangerous thing. Many people would never want to make that choice themselves for a variety of reasons, but as a culture, we recognize people's right to make that choice. And I think part of the reason that extreme spiritual pursuits don't garner the same legitimacy in culture is because uh, the value, you know, when I was pursuing extreme uh, spiritual practices, it was because I had had experiences that so dramatically shifted my understanding of reality that I felt they were worth the risk. I didn't I didn't go into this blind, thinking that there was no risk. Uh, I went into it knowing there was risk. In fact, for all of all of uh, all of the problems my teacher had, he was honest with me. The very first thing he told me, because I asked him, "Where where do I find the faith to give my life to this? Uh, you know, and know that it's going to turn out okay." And he said, 
How do you know it's going to turn out okay? It could turn out a complete mess. If you knew it was going to turn out okay, why would you need faith? You wouldn't need faith. You'd have a guarantee, and I don't offer guarantees. So he wasn't dishonest about at least that part. Uh, and I, I took that to heart, and I went into it that way. But I felt it was worth the risk because what I had tasted, what I had experienced as a possibility was so dramatically possible, I couldn't imagine living without it. Uh, and so, you know, I think part of what will help the making this a legitimate choice in culture is increasing people's awareness as to why people make, because that's what people ask me now, still. <laughs> they want to know, why did you join a community like that? And why did you stay in it for 20 years, given the challenges and the abuses? It's because the experiences I was having kept confirming for me that it was worth it. Uh, I didn't feel trapped. Now, this is, again, remember, this is my experience, and there's a lot of different experiences, and there's a lot of coercion involved in spiritual communities, and that's obviously bad. In my case, I felt that I was making a legitimate choice to engage in risky endeavors because I felt it was worth it. Uh, and there have always been people who made that choice. I think uh, once we legitimize this as a choice, we say, okay, some people do make this choice, so how are we going to make it safer? We can have a conversation. And I think one of the things we need to have a conversation about and what I write about is understanding that choice and understanding that it's a choice that throughout history people have made. So here's just a quick paragraph for you. It says, any study of the history of alternative and extreme spiritual pursuit quickly reveals that there have always been those who were called to explore edges of spirituality beyond the accepted norms of their culture. St. John of the Cross wrote The Dark Night of the Soul after a hellish nine months in prison, and he was only later recognized as a saint. The list of formerly imprisoned saints from all traditions is, is long enough to give us evidence that there are always those who choose to push beyond the edges of accepted convention. Now, of course, not all spiritual rebels become saints or social reformers, but history undeniably shows that this is a choice that will always compel some individuals and at least occasionally to the great benefit of society. If the history of extreme spiritual pursuit was better known, we might find room in ourselves to accept the radical spiritual choices that others make today or that we ourselves feel called to. So uh, that's the, the second, the, the first thing, the second thing that I, I'm talking about in this paper and really feeling like people need to understand that choice, need to understand the history of that choice, need to see it, oh, this is, a, this is something that some people choose and always have and always will. Uh, so that it can be brought into the light of day. The second thing we need to understand is uh, what the risk is. And there's lots of literature in my paper. I go through a lot of the literature that's available that it describes the risk of deep spiritual involvement uh, so that people can understand what it takes, you know, and, and what, what is at risk and what can happen. And that's very important. Uh, the final thing uh, that I have in the paper that I want to mention, because I think it's the most important, it's certainly my experience bears out that it's the most important, is there really needs to be a deeper understanding in the context of extreme spiritual pursuit, and particularly in the context of devotion to a teacher, working with a teacher, what are the dynamics of consent? Uh, and this is, this is something that's being explored Generally, uh, I found a, a wonderful book called The Art of Receiving and Giving, The Wheel of Consent, written by Betty Martin. And what I loved about it was how she speaks about consent. Is not, it's not a form of permission that one gives once. Consent is a, is a dynamic agreement that needs to be continually maintained and updated. And in my spiritual work with, with my, my community, community, that was that not the case. Uh, you know, a, an agreement was made once at the very beginning and, and you were held to it. 
And the agreement was, you will do whatever it takes. And that was it. Uh, and I just think that doesn't work because people change, people grow, circumstances change and grow. When I work with people, I'm constantly wanting to leave space for people to grow. I want to leave porous edges for people to come and go. Uh, it's, it, you need to be able to accommodate change. So let me just finish by reading this bit on uh, the dynamic maintenance of consent, and that will just, just about finish me up. It says, the dynamic of maintaining mutual consent may seem to fly in the face of the depth of surrender traditionally demanded of a student-teacher-guru-disciple relationship, but I, not, I do not believe that it has to be. The effectiveness of this dynamic to support the transformative process will depend on the, subtle and, the subtlety and sophistication of the questions being asked. For instance, a teacher may ask, may I demand that you give up relationships that I see as detrimental to your spiritual growth? This is undoubtedly a big ask, but if a student feels that this is within the bounds of the relationship and agrees to it, then a mutual understanding is arrived at and the teacher has a more clear understanding of the domain of consent. On the other hand, the student might ask the teacher, will you always give me the right to say no to any of your demands if I see them as harmful to myself? The teacher might not be willing to agree to this, but it would certainly serve to clarify the power dynamic of the relationship. If we are drawn to an extreme spiritual path under the guidance of a teacher, I do believe that some form of dynamically maintained mutual consent is a bare minimal requirement to ensure that everyone, student and teacher alike, are protected from misunderstanding and harm. Uh, and so with that, I will, uh, I will end. Uh, just, to, just to review, I think, I think extreme spiritual pursuit has always been a part of, of human history. It still is. People like me and others feel drawn to it. If it's not seen as a legitimate choice, it will end up uh, in the shadowy outskirts where it can fester in unhealthy forms. If we legitimize it, we can start to ask questions like, why are people making this choice? What are the risks involved? And how is con consent maintained along with many, many others so that the risk of extreme spiritual pursuit uh, can be mitigated and those who choose to engage in it can do so as safely as, as is possible. Uh, and that's an exploration I'm happy that we're engaged in. So, uh, so with that, thank you all very, very much. Uh, and I think I did pretty well, Bianca. <laughs> Sponsored by the Program for the Evolution of Spirituality. Copyright 2023, President and Fellows of Harvard College.